you were uh, looking forward to the science? Yeah. <laughs> yeah? How long have I got? How many minutes ago it's half past? One. One. One minute. Okay, so uh, like the screen says, I am Andy Minton. I am one of the elite personal trainers based over in third space in Soho. A uh, tiny bit about myself before uh, I get started. I've been a coach now for 16, 17 years. Uh, I've done everything really in this industry from fitness instructor, exercise to music, sports manager, fitness manager, uh, and I've been a full time personal trainer in third space for 10 years now. Um, and in that time, I've been lucky enough to study and to work with some of the best strength coaches, performance coaches, bodybuilders, and physique athletes uh, this country has to offer. Um, and like a lot of people in the industry, this is a passion of mine as well as my job. So it's something I like to read a lot about. Um, science, when it comes to strength training, when it comes to any aspect of this, this industry, is always changing. So it's important to stay ahead of the curve and, uh, and constantly researching. So, um, I want to kind of, uh, it's 45 minutes to talk about strength training, so that's a, a very short amount of time for something I've studied for most of my professional career. And so I kind of broke it down to what I feel the key, oh, it works, okay, the key aspects when it comes to strength training. So we're going to talk about the different types of strength training that you can do. We're going to go through key variables to manipulate, reps, sets, tempo, frequency, volume, that kind of thing. We'll discuss it all and it all makes sense when we go through it. Uh, choosing the right exercise for you, kind of important. Um, again, it's 45 minutes, so I've only really got time to do the squat and deadlift, um, so squat patterns and hinge patterns. And then we're going to talk about how to build your own workout. So rather than sort of generically throwing exercise into a workout, actually maybe think about what you need, what your body needs, what you do, what exercises you probably need to do more of. And then we'll go through myth busting because with the world of social media, there's a lot of stuff out there that's just either not quite right or it's just a blatant lie. So I want to go through and hopefully spell some myths at the same time. If you've got any questions, um, hopefully I can get through all this in 45 minutes. If you've got questions, you can ask me at the end. Every time I practice this, I've gone over a little bit, so uh, we'll see how it goes. So first up, what is strength? Um, so strength is your rate of force production. So force can be calculated, uh, mass, time, acceleration. So the weight in which is on a bar, time to speed in which you move that bar. So kind of a caveat on this, I'm talking a lot about barbells and dumbbells, um, but strength is relative to anything. So if you're thinking, hey, this guy say squatting, I'm thinking chin-ups and bodyweight work, or single leg work, pistol squats, that kind of thing. It's all relative, like your body weight becomes the mass and the speed in which you move becomes obviously the acceleration state. Um, so yeah, it's always going to be relative depending on whatever exercise you choose. So why is it important to increase strength? So I guess a lot of people do strength training for uh, body composition, um, thinking about increasing muscle mass. When I think of strength training, I think more about performance. Um, each and every one of you plays a sport of some description. If you're running, yoga, tennis, skiing, cycling to work, that becomes your sport. So if you're able to produce more force, decelerate more force, able to control your joints, your muscles, uh, through full range of motion, then you're able to protect those joints, you're able to manage forces much better. So I think of it from sort of injury prevention as well as from performance. Okay, so back to my sort of barbell thinking of training. So when you're in the gym, there's different kinds of training that you can do for strength. So right at the top is absolute strength, or your maximum force production. So thinking back to that previous slide when we were saying force time acceleration, when it comes to maximum strength, the, the low, the mass, is what you're thinking about. That's going to be at the highest. When you do maximum force production work, you're still going to try and move the bar as fast as possible, but the loads will be so heavy that you're probably not going to move that fast. But the intention will always be to move quickly. Moving down from there, strength endurance. Now that's probably where most of you guys have come into strength training, you're doing more repeated bouts on a given load. Um, then speed strength and strength speed, they sound similar, but there's a subtle difference. So they're generally a bit more sport specific, but again, they're totally relevant to everyone. Uh, so speed strength, again, going back to that force is mass time acceleration. Speed strength, you're focusing much more on acceleration. So the, the load might be quite light, uh, but the speed at which you move will be really fast. So if you're thinking like medicine throws and really explosive exercise. 
Whereas strength speed is then you're focusing more on the load, the speed should still be pretty quick. Um, so for this, you're thinking really Olympic lifts, so cleans, um, snatch, that kind of thing. These next two don't necessarily train for relative strength, so your strength to body weight ratio isn't something that I'm going to program someone for, but that should always be moving as your body weight obviously will alter, but your strength to body weight ratio uh, will be the thing that always increases. And this last one's a really important factor. I had this this morning because I had a really bad night's sleep. I went to the gym and I sucked. So there's always been a limit to your output when it goes to the gym. If any guy can step foot into the weights room, you know. Sometimes you just don't feel right. Um, environmental factors, stress, poor sleep, bad nutrition, hangover, it, loads of things that could stop you being able to show your maximum full production. And this creates what we call a strength deficit. So always appreciate that if you are doing absolute strength work, you're probably always working at a slight deficit. And that becomes quite important when it comes to program design. Okay, so this is a big one, I want to spend a bit of time here because this I guess is where I get asked the most questions about strength training. So what actually makes us strong? Because the first thought is that the size of the muscle is going to determine how strong that person is. And to a degree that is correct, but the key is the central nervous system. Strength training is about recruiting muscle fibers. It's about your brain. Your brain's ability to fire receptors in the muscle to be able to produce more force. Yes, the bigger the muscles, the larger the cross-sectional size of the tissue, the more potential to get strong, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be stronger. Thinking back to that relative strength, you must know people that are very, very light, but can lift a phenomenal amount of weight with their body weight. Um, so strength can't be about size, it has to be about something else. And that's why uh, it's really important to understand the brain's job when it comes to uh, strength training. Um, so what are the differences between strength training, building muscle, and bodybuilding? So we've already covered strength training. We now know force production and your central nervous system, they're key. Building muscle is now slightly different. So we've got here intramuscular tension and metabolic stress. So tension isn't really confused with force. Um, tension is slightly different. When a muscle is under load for a prolonged period of time, it will be under a great amount of tension. So underneath that, I put time under tension. So for every movement that you do in the gym, be it a bicep curl, there's a, an eccentric phase, which is a lowering phase, where the load's in the arm or the, on the back, whatever exercise you're doing, and you're decelerating that load under tension. The concentric phase is then the lifting phase. Hi guys. Um, it's like a 360 degree sort of. <laughs> um, yeah, so the concentric phase is that lifting phase. Uh, and then isometric. So isometric is going to be where you just do a hold. So you can pause at any point in the movement, it can be the top, it can be the bottom of the movement. So the key for increasing muscle versus increasing strength is that I'm going to manipulate my time under tension to increase the amount of tension placed on that muscle. Um, and that tension creates metabolic stress and it creates muscle protein breakdown. And muscle protein breakdown is key when it comes to uh, increasing muscle mass because then that's when your nutrition comes into play. So if you consume more protein than you've broken down through movement effectively, net you will increase muscle tissue. There is a lot more to it than that, and anybody who's out there would kill me for making it so simplified, but in a nutshell, that's the difference. Like you're maintaining a muscle under tension for a long period of time. You're breaking that tissue down, you're creating this intramuscular tension, you're creating this metabolic stress. Through your diet, you're taking enough protein at time at the right time and the right quantities, and therefore you grow. And then, I guess the main reason I put this slide in here is the conversation is always, well, I don't want to get really big. Like you see bodybuilders, they're enormous. But bodybuilding and building muscle are two very different things. There's an argument, bodybuilding is a sport in its own right. Um, every bodybuilder I know is incredible in their pursuit of symmetry, in their pursuit of increasing muscles over a very like, specific part and region of their body. Continuous balance of training um, and lifestyle becomes huge. If you ever speak to a bodybuilder, they are a bodybuilder. They are a, they live it. It's not, they're not out of the weekends drinking, they're sleeping, they understand recovery, they understand program design, they know what the body can do. Certainly a more experienced bodybuilder. So what I'm trying to say is, yes, you can get strong, and you definitely should train for strength. Yes, you can increase muscle mass um, by 
increase in that time on attention. Are you going to get enormous? No. Like it takes years and years and years to increase a serious amount of muscle. Um, the last, last but always brings people out because it says anabolic. So in creating an uh, anabolic support window effectively for growth. So anabolic just means a, a state of positive energy repair. So if you guys have just eaten and you feel pretty rested, like you're sat there and your body's in an anabolic state where you can grow hair, nails, skin, you name it. Uh, and in that moment in time, you can also build muscle. So when it comes to creating excessive amounts of muscle built on a frame, you need to be very, very mindful of how you create the anabolic support window. And of course, there are anabolic steroids artificially support that by altering your hormones. Now, I guess a few of you might be thinking, yeah, but I did X and my legs got really big, so he's talking rubbish because I know that I can build muscle quickly. Uh, and this comes up quite a lot. So there's different types of muscle fibers that you can build, and this is kind of a real key point for my overall speech. I feel that people are a bit too reactive to strength training. They'll go into the gym, they'll lift some weights, their muscles get pumped up, Two days later, the muscles still feel big, and they're like, oh my god, my muscles are massive, it's horrible. I've got to do something else. Um, so there's two types of muscle fiber, or two types of what we call hypertrophy. So hypertrophy is just a fancy word for bodybuilding. My fibril hypertrophy is what we call functional hypertrophy. That's the actual laying down of new sarcomeres and new muscle fibers that your brain can use and that you are going to be functionally stronger. Whereas sarcoplasmic hypertrophy is then, like it sounds, it's plasma. It's a steroid of fluid in a muscle. So the fluid that's stored into the muscle is going to be glycogen, sugar, and hydrogen, water. Because as you're training, doing strength training, your body needs more energy, and it needs, obviously, to hydrate. Um, and sarcoplasmic hypertrophy is instantly noticeable. A really good example of this is doing a spin class, where you're sat in the same position, pumping away, and when they hit flex, it takes a lot of load. The next day, your hip flexor, your quads, will be bigger. They'll be in that state of sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, and that goes down after 24, 48 hours. Um, so, what I'm trying to say basically is, when it comes to strength training, it's about playing the long game. Don't be too reactive to sudden changes in body shape. Are you laying down new muscle fiber overnight? Definitely not. It takes time. Um, be patient with it. And like I was saying, so the functional hypertrophy comes more from kind of heavier weightlifting, and this cyclic hypertrophy comes from more volume-based lifting. So the guys in the room that work out, you know that in the session you do 12 reps on bicep curls, and you're, your arms are enormous. So we call it a pump. Guys love it. Girls probably aren't quite so keen to have their arms swollen. So you can manipulate fluid in a body to um, to give you that response if you want it. Um, but ultimately, if you're looking to get strong and you're not looking to be bloated with fluid, then I would lean more towards strength training, heavier weightlifting, and not doing volume-based weightlifting. And a quick one as well, on the different types of muscle fibers, uh, type 1, type 2, type 2B, you might have seen this written before. So type 1 is your endurance muscle fiber, this is the kind of continuous bout. This is the way that we can actually have endurance runners, marathon runners and sprinters, so type 2 and type 2B is then your explosive athlete. So as you're laying down these different types of muscle fiber, the myofibril, that within that there'll also be different types of type 1, type 2, type 2B, and you're genetically going to be dominant towards a certain one. So you'll either know that you're more endurance based or you'll know you're more power explosive. Um, if you try and make someone really explosive, do a marathon, they hate it. So that's effectively a nice basic test to see if you're more dominant towards type 2B or if you're dominant towards type 1. Okay, so that's the uh, strength phase out of the way. So real quickly we'll work through this because this might be pretty obvious for some of you guys. Uh, actually, I need to shamelessly get you to follow me on social media because uh, I've got a few um, slides, a take home slides for you. So there's ambulance and PT, get your phones out, and uh, an admin. There's a slide in a second I need you guys to see and it's, I want you to take home because it's important. Okay, so repetitions you know, yeah? So that's the amount of repetitions, repeated uh, bouts of a particular exercise. Sets is then the cluster of repetitions in a, in a cycle. So you might do 10 repetitions, three sets. Um, and that creates volume, your total training volume. So the amount of reps, sets, and exercise that you do creates a total training volume for a workout. Um, tempo we discussed, eccentric, isometric, concentric. There's two moments in time, really, that you can do an isometric board, where there's loads of moments in time, but at the bottom of a lowering phase and at the top of a lifting phase. 
So this is a really good example here, you guys can't see it, but the strength tempo could be a three second lowering phase if I'm squatting and three seconds under tension, there's no pause, I explode out, there's no pause and I go back down. Whereas for bodybuilding, for hypertrophy, I'm going to be five seconds of time under tension all the way down, five second eccentric, two second pause at the bottom, one second up. Um, so big difference between the way that you manipulate tempo for strength versus bodybuilding. Okay, so when you think about a weekly manipulation of uh, um, these variables, so frequency is the amount of times you train per week, uh, volume of disgust is your total amount of reps and sets and exercises, and then intensity. Um, so intensity is one of my real club bears, and if you know me, I moan like this all the time. So what the industry perceives as intensity is kind of like how hard you're working, whereas what coaches perceive as intensity is actually the rate of force production how much load is on the bar, how hard you're working. If you're on a bike, it's really about wattage. If you're on a rowing machine, it's the same. It's how hard you're working, power output. It's got nothing to do with how hard you think you're working as a person at the moment in time. So these three things cannot be high at the same time. They have to be on a sliding scale. If I want to train every day of the week, and I want to train with high volume, that instantly dictates the intensity has to be low. You cannot have high intensity, high volume, and high frequency. And this is probably where CrossFit got in trouble in the early years, where it was maybe trying to do a bit too much of everything. Um, so understanding how to manage your framework of how often you train hard is really important. So essential fatigue is just exactly that. Like it's, it's your body's overall fatigue. Uh, we, we a year ago I would have said central nervous system fatigue, but that's probably not a correct terminology. So central fatigue is just, we're just doing too much. Too much the same kind of thing, and you're just tired. You can't recover, nutrition will be right, it's too much right. And understand that intensity and fatigue are very, very different. So we're, we're in a, a time in the industry where everyone's talking about high intensity training, high intensity interval training specifically. My argument to high intensity training is that the ability to train high intensity means you've got to be recovered. You've got to be rested, hydrated, slept, and you've got to have no injuries. If you're training high intensity frequently, you're doing classes that say the high intensity frequently. Are you training high intensity or are you just training full retired? I'd argue you're doing the latter. You're training hard, don't get me wrong, but it's just not high intensity. So when you're thinking about programming your week, you're looking at doing bouts of high intensity, be it with conditioning or with load, so if you're doing this heavy strength work or I'm doing actual high intensity classes. Be sensible, factor in a couple of days of recovery, make sure when you come into the gym, you can really hit it hard. Okay, so this is the, uh, the slide that I want you to basically have, it's on my social media. So these are the parameters for everything I've just said. So, percentage load for strength, power, hypertrophy, and endurance, your rep ranges, your set ranges, your rest between sets, the overall time, so the duration per set, so how that's that time on attention again, uh, manipulating the eccentric, concentric, uh, the speed at which you're moving, and the amount of times you can train per week. So everything I've just said is basically on there. So again, if you follow me on social media, um, you'll have that. Should you train to failure? Um, basically, not as often as you think. Um, again, we're at a period of the industry where people feel that, like training hard and getting sore is what it's all about. Um, Progressive overload is key. Progressively challenging your body to be able to deal with the stress you're placing upon it is paramount. That doesn't mean adding weight to the bar. That doesn't mean progressing anything in fairness. It can just be getting confident at a lift, getting used to the weight of the bar, getting the barbell on your back, getting used to the weight of the bar on your shoulders, adding pauses at the bottom, maybe manipulating the tempo a little bit. Um, but this base building, a brilliant book called Base Building um, by Paul Carter, just to talk about building a framework of um, just confidence within yourself when it comes to progressive overload. So it's not about adding weight, it's not really about adding reps, it's just about feeling better about an exercise, and then as you feel better, you can progressively start to add weight to the bar. But I'm more than happy to have a client stick to the same weight for three weeks, watch them get better, watch them speed up their, their fourth production before progressing the load any further. And then delayed onset muscle soreness. So this is a moment I get every day now. It's like, oh, I had a great workout. I was sore for three days. I'm like, shit workout. I don't know what coach made you do that, but it's not clever. Um, I would say most of us here, when we do weight training, we're here for some sort of physique driven. Yes, you might have performance goals, but weight training is also a really nice way to get lean. 
So this is the next slide I want to cover. I know this is digressing slightly from, uh, uh, from strength training. You've got to understand what happens in the human body when it comes to burning calories. So if you're sore for three days after you train, so this is your total daily energy expenditure. Um, so this is the overall amount of calories you burn in a day. You're obviously all being totally different. This is 100% of the calories you burn. So the massive red block at the bottom is your resting metabolic rate. So that's your organs, your muscles, your heart, everything working together to burn calories. That has got the biggest chunk of that block, and you can't really alter that. You can't alter it on a daily basis. The next one is the thermogenic effect of meals. So when you, when you consume food, it takes energy to break down food. Those two are kind of preset. You can't do them like that. Uh, NEATS is your non-exercise activity thermogenesis. That is a fancy way of saying walk the stairs, cycling to work, making the choices that just make you move more often. And then the little slither at the top is exercise. Now obviously you can argue that some people train more than others, but know that the, the amount of activity you do outside of the gym burns more calories um, than the exercise itself. So if you're sore for three days after training and your focus is body composition, and you can't exercise for those two days, you choose to get a train to work rather than cycle, then you massively reduce the amount of calories you burn per day. So training to failure, training and thinking that soreness is somehow a barometer of how hard you work is a very foolish way to go about strength training. And we about dangerous way to go about strength training. Um, so basically, real quickly, the way that you would go about planning these workouts would be to periodize your training. Because you can't get strong, big, fast, lean, and increase muscle mass all at once. So you would just do it in blocks. So you'd spend, say, four to six weeks doing a certain activity. So I put movement prep. So this is kind of like, for me, my foundation to when I take on a client. I spend four weeks getting their patterns right. Now, if you haven't got a trainer with you, that can be just watching YouTube videos. Make sure whatever pattern you're doing, be it pull up, be it a deadlift, that you're just working on trying to improve the technique. Work at speed, sorry, at strength speed. We said that strength speed was kind of light to low, fast. It's a nice way, it hasn't got to be doing a bit lift, it can be doing a squat. We haven't got to go really heavy, but you can just groove a really nice workout. So that's that progressive overload, it fits really nicely. You can then do some max strength, and that's relative. If you've never done weight training before, max strength can be six reps. Where if you've done loads of weight training, excuse me, max rep can be one. So max strength can be one rep. And then you can do hypertrophy, or you can do conditioning, you can do whatever. So just by building into blocks, don't just try and Throw strength training in, so work out what you need. Try and actually think, right, I'm going to spend six weeks trying to get stronger. And then allocate a goal to each of the blocks. So movement prep goal is be video of the workout, send it to the coach online, get a bit of feedback. Uh, strength training, uh, sorry, uh, speed strength and max strength, and movement of the weight in the bar. Body is a bit hard to add um, goals to. Conditioning is really easy because you'll have output or whatever activity is you're doing. Okay, so choosing the right exercise for you. Now, I'm going to bore you a little bit with uh, some physics, and then hopefully I'll come over in a second. So, that's how I'm going to be talking about squats a lot. Um, so the bar will be, always be over the centre of mass and travelling vertically. So appreciate, where the bottom, appreciate wherever there's a load, there's going to be a vertical force applied to that load, and it will drop straight down. So if I've got a bar on my back, that force is going vertically through my body, and it's going to be over my centre of mass, so it's going to be over my toes. If it's very heavy and I lean forward, it's going to push me over. If I lean back, it's going to drive me straight back. So that vertical force is always there. And then there's other forces. There's rotational forces around a joint, and then there's levers, there's moan arms. So that might mean nothing, but hopefully in a second it will mean something. So you guys can't see this, but... Um, okay, you guys can't see this. I'm trying to explain it well. Um, so, the picture on the far left, the guy's holding the weight out to the side, and the vertical force is going straight through the middle and it's balanced. As that weight is moved away, the moment arm is increased. And the further the weight away, the longer the moment arm. So the amount of force going through him is far greater as the moment arm moves further away. So why is this important? Is your proportions will alter the weight you lift. So what are your proportions? So this isn't, uh, these aren't girls that I train. I'm taking this from uh, Brett Contreras' website. Um, he's awesome, he's worth following, don't follow. So these two girls are the same height. They've got roughly the same floor to knee, and then the girl on the left has got a much shorter femur, much shorter thigh. The girl on the right has a much longer thigh. The girl on the left has a much longer torso. The girl on the right has a much shorter torso. 
but they're the same height, okay? But they're going to move very, very differently when you make them squat. For some reason, I like, switch the girls over to the side of this. What we think is one better or worse than the other. I would generally think when I view it on social media, people might start commenting along the left. Girls really far forward, she's limp right over, her knees are over her toe. It doesn't look probably as comfortable where the girl on the right, she's lovely and tall, knees are back, she looks pretty balanced. Kind of agree with that? Think on the right looks a bit better. So thinking back to what we are saying about vertical forces, as a vertical force, that bar is always going to be over the centre of mass. So the moment arms become the distance of the hip and the knee move away from that vertical line. So in this position here with a really long femur, you can have really big moment arms in both directions. For this girl, because she's got such a long femur, her hips are way far back. So she's in a, a position where her hips buying up a lot of the movement here. Well, as the girl on the right, she's probably got an equal amount of distance where the knees travel away from that vertical line. Um, Neither's right or wrong, better or worse, it's just different. So what I'm basically trying to say is if you've tried squatting and you feel it's really hard and some coach might have told you you're tight here or tight there, maybe just check the proportions because some people just are biomechanically at a slight disadvantage position to be, to be doing particular lifts. Doesn't mean you can't do them, this means you've got to find the right one for you. So bar placement changes everything. So here's, this is kind of a nice way, now you can see, that's the vertical line. The distance from the hip or the knee to that, that line creates those moment arms. The guy on the left has got a low bar back squat. So the bar is way down his shoulders and he's sitting right back into his squat. So he's making that more hip dominant. There's more rotational force around his hip. Whereas the one in the middle is a high bar. Oh, also, this is on my social media, guys, so you can look at my Instagram and um, So it's more balanced. Yeah, the distance the knees travel from that uh, vertical line and the hip is roughly about the same. Obviously, your portion will change this. And then a front squat is very little knee, uh, knee torque, sorry, very little hip torque, low to knee torque. None of these exercises are better than the others. They just place different challenges on the body. So if you're struggling to do an exercise, let's say, because most people go to the middle one and do the, the, the high bar back squat. If you're struggling with it, try a low bar back squat. If you're struggling with that, try a front squat. Try and find a bar placement that fits your body rather than trying to fit your body around the particular bar place. And it's exactly the same with deadlift. Long arm deadlifters. So again, here's that, that vertical line, that vertical force. The moment arm is represented by the blue line and this is the rotational force around the joint. So same portions in the trunk, femur and shin, but one guy's got longer arms than the other. Um, so the chap on the right has to flex way over more, he's got a much flatter back, he's got a lot more rotational force going through his hip, and he's going to move that bar a lot, lot further. Um, so the guy on the left could probably lift a lot more weight, because by mechanical means he's in a position that's more advantageous for that lift. I have no problem with putting three inch block underneath the plates for this guy on the right to mean that he's starting a bit higher up. You haven't got to start a deadlift off the floor. A, uh, a plate, an Olympic plate, has a three, eight and three quarter inch drop from the hole in the center to the edge. And that's set up by the Olympic committee because most deadlifters are, will be able to fit under the bar if they lost the overhead. So it's a safety mechanism. There's nothing to do with what a deadlift should be. So if you don't feel like you can do a conventional deadlift off the floor, then don't. Try elevating it. There's other ways to do a deadlift. So elevating it is one way. There are others. Sadly, I haven't much time to go through, so I can't go through all the deadlift variations. But there are tons of deadlift variations out there. I'm going to blast this real quickly. So basically, this is different proportions and how a deadlift can look different. So if you've got an idea in your mind's eye what the perfect deadlift should look like, and you don't feel your body fits that mold, so you think you suck at deadlifting, be mindful that a deadlift can look like anything. It doesn't matter. Nothing's right, or wrong, better or worse. It is just what it is. You might just need to change the setup to fit your mechanics. <coughs> okay, so we're moving to. Uh, oh, I didn't set a timer. How many time? 17 minutes. Okay. So when it comes to building a workout, then, so this is big for me. So we're not bodybuilders in the room. Like, everyone always thinks about muscles. They'll come to me and say, Andy, what's the best glute exercise? Or what's the best chest exercise? But the human body doesn't work in glutes by itself or chest by itself. We work in movement patterns. Um, so when it comes to creating a workout, you want to start thinking in movement patterns and not thinking in, in muscle groups. So for the lower body, 
you either have a lower body hip dominance or a low body knee dominance. And hopefully you're starting to think back to that previous slide. I can make a squat hip dominant by going low bar, um, and I can make a squat very knee dominant by going for a front squat. So you've got different deadlift variations for the hip dominant, uh, and you've got different squat variations, so step up, split squat, lunge, they're just a knee dominant exercise. They're all pretty much the same kind of thing. Um, then the upper body is broken down into push or pull, uh, horizontal or vertical. So you've got upper body, uh, sorry, push, upper body, horizontal, it's going to be a chest press or a press up. A push vertical is going to be a shoulder press or an overhead press. You can pull horizontally, which could be a, a TRX suspension row or it could be a bent over row. Um, and you can pull vertically. So that's going to be your pull ups or your lat pull downs. A little note at the bottom uh, that trunk and rotation work will be in as well. So you're building your own workout. Don't think about just applying random exercise to it. Actually think have I got a hip dominant? lower limb, knee dominant lower limb, push, pull, vertical and horizontal, and then main trunk work you might want to put in as well. Okay, so uh, think about what your overall goals are. So if you're building strength, um, intensity is a key driver, so the volume is really low, and the frequency is really low. If you're looking to increase your speed and power, if you're doing sport specific movements, low frequency, moderate load, and focusing on skill acquisition. Now the main reason I put this slide in here is the most first two. It's the last tip. So I've got a client who's coming to me to lose fat. I make her, them, him or her, do exactly the same as a client who's looking to build muscle. I put them into a hypertrophic phase of training. I'm going to manipulate their diet accordingly. Um, but ultimately, during a fat loss phase, maintaining muscle mass is key. You cast your mind back to the slide when we were talking about resting metabolic rate being the biggest driver so how many calories you burn per day, your muscles are part of your resting metabolic rate. So if you're doing a lot of energy deficit work, a lot of high calorie in your cardio, you could be catabolizing. So we said earlier, anabolic was a positive state of energy repair, well the negative of that is catabolic. Catabolic's not a bad thing, but a catabolic state for weight training is probably not ideal. Um, so maintaining muscle mass is key. Um, so if you're doing aggressive dieting for holidays, I would naturally move my weight training to more hypertrophy styles, slower tempos, pairing exercises back to back, uh, higher density training, uh, I think I've got less high density means you just have more exercises in the workout, uh, moderate high frequency, uh, low to moderate intensity. So you're not going to be lifting very heavy when it comes to doing what you're doing. So glad I'm wearing light growing to sweat and stay. Okay, and then this is massive. Think about what you need. Don't just think about what you're, you want to work on all the time. Um, if you're stuck in office all day long and you're not doing much activity, then you might have weak glutes, weak core. So let's think what works the glutes. It's going to be more hip dominant, lower limb exercise. You might do a low bar back squat, you might do more negative things. Uh, you'll be doing more pull work to the upper body, you're adding core work and rotation. If you're a recreational runner, you're doing a lot of knee dominant exercises already, so you're not going to really do any knee dominant work. Loads of glutes, loads of upper back, uh, and suddenly like pulling glutes to the upper body. Uh, so yeah, we've got more hinge work, more of, uh, not much knee dominant work, and the stuff you do is probably going to be more one foot rather than two feet. Cycle to work, you're generally going to be stuck in flexion on a bike, therefore doing some work to hit the uh, posterior chain. So you're going to hinge every session. If I've got a cyclist coming into the gym, I do very little squatting. There's all ways to hinge the You do a lot of yoga, so pretty relevant to a lot of you guys. Um, I go for slow controlled um, tempos, pauses and end ranges, and making sure you do like, full range of motion. Because um, you might be very, very flexible, but you might not have control at the very end ranges of your flexibility. Okay, and you might have some accessory work specific to the key lifts, so we've only discussed squat and billet. Um, so if you're weak in your lower back in a squat, you might apply some lower back specific work. If you've got poor ankle mobility, um, you might put in some specific work for that. If you're weak at parallel, so parallel is just going to be getting down to uh, the thigh and parallel to the floor, you might put some specific exercise in to get you stronger from parallel. Then if you're the same, if you're weak with the floor, so you find it hard to pull the weight off the floor, or you're weak around the knee, or you've got a weak grip, you can start to apply exercise to that. Again, I know I'm sort of 
scared to over it and not actually doing what exercise as you need to do, but you can find these out. Um, it's just start thinking, if you've got moving patterns, you're, you're training, if you're always hammering the conventional deadlift, you're just not getting any stronger. You need to fix the weakness. Don't keep hammering the entire lift. Okay, last bit then, myth busting. Uh, so first up is you shouldn't lift your knees past your toes in squatting. What do we think? Depends. If I've got a long femur, a uh, short torso, hell yeah, your knees are going to fly over your toe. Nothing you can do about it. Um, the problem with generic overall um, coaching cues is that we're not the same, we're not generic, we're all different. So if you feel that knee going over your toe actually is fine for you, then do it. On the flip side, if it hurts your knees going over your toes, and not seeing drawback. Um, don't necessarily try and force the knee behind your toe. It's going to make you hinge your squat massively. If you do, if you've got a lower back problem, that can be an issue. So, um, so yeah, just do what's right, what feels right for your body. Using light weight to increase muscle tone, hopefully we've touched on this already really. So um, I put here myogenic tone. So if you guys know any personal trainers, strength training coaches, when you say the word tone to a trainer, they generally hate it. It doesn't really mean anything. Um, I guess what you mean is you want to lose a bit of body fat and increase the, the density of muscle. But the word tone actually comes from the expression myogenic tone. And myogenic tone, is a muscle in a state of readiness. So if you think of a sprinter, 100 meter sprinter, off the blocks, their muscles are wired, ready for action, yeah? And that's because our back, they were doing one rep max work, they were doing explosive work, box jumps, that kind of thing. Um, so I think that doing lightweight to increase the tone of tissue, and we already know that lightweight increases plasma into tissue, is gonna make you look more pumped, more fluidy. Um, if you want to actually increase the toe, I would always move more to strength work. Things below sort of six reps. Women can't build as much muscle mass as men. Now, this is big because if I had done this talk 18 months ago, that would be on there. And this is where trying to start today with current research is really important. Um, so, about yeah, about a year or so ago, I started reading some work on uh, on this. Whereas we all know that men start with a higher base point uh, of muscle mass. No one's going to argue that. And um, men have more testosterone than women. No one's going to ask that, uh, argue that. But the issue here is that kind of uh, correlation cause. Just because men have more testosterone doesn't necessarily mean that's the reason that uh, their bodies are different in some way. If you think about it, up until about three years ago, women weren't really that bothered about increasing muscle mass. So how many pieces of research do you think we've done? 10 years ago, or women in weight training? Pretty much none. Um, whereas, fast forward to now, we've got a huge body of research coming out um, to show that actually women can build just as much muscle mass as men, if not more. But if women can't build as much muscle mass as men, how come when I go into CrossFit gyms, there's women that look absolutely incredible? Like, it just can't be the case that these women are somehow genetically different to everyone else. So, where is women are different to men? Yes, you have less testosterone. You have an equal amount of IGF-1 growth factor. You don't even know what that is, but just know it's important when it comes to the muscle. You have three times as much human growth hormone. Now that's huge. So procreation for, for childbirth, you need growth hormone. Um, women just turn out and you build muscle in different pathways to men. So don't feel that somehow you're at a genetic disposition, you can't build muscle because you can. Uh, there's women doing it every single day. Women do need to train slightly differently to men. Um, men sort of fall into the classic split routine, chest day, back day, leg day. That's not uh, relevant for women. Women metabolize fuel totally differently, so you can do much more full body training and more repeats about to recover way quicker than guys, so you can do more training, more full body training. Um, guys, if I'm making you full body training Monday, Wednesday, Friday, by Friday, you pay Whereas women, they love it, it's absolutely fine. So we need to train slightly differently. The fat loss workout. Um, I guess it's not really on strength training, but I guess a lot of people do use strength training for fat loss. You've got to stop thinking about how a workout is what burns fat. Because you've got to think, cast your mind back to that previous slide. You, you look to see what actually makes up your total daily energy expenditure. It's more than just the exercise component. The exercise component was depressingly small at the top. You've got to think of a 360 degree approach to fat loss. Yes, your training's got to be right. Yes, you've got to move around outside the gym. Nutrition's got to be on point. You've got to be sleepy, recovering, your hydration's got to be important. 
It's not just about training. If you're always thinking about training, and you're all of a sudden trying to out-train poor lifestyle choices. Um, so there is no such thing as fat loss workout. Burning calories in the gym is important, but it's nowhere near as important. It's a takeover from everything else. You've got to try and get all the pieces in check. And yeah, you can break away from it. You can actually, you can have a binge here and there. But um, don't think I had a binge just so I'll go to the gym and hand myself this amount and then fix that. It's not like you. You're better off just recovering and going back to the gym and training properly. Um, high intensity training isn't always the best. That's the same with strength training. You haven't got to be doing high intensity, heavy load of strength training. Um, and it hasn't got to be high intensity training in uh, like class environment either. You can do recovery work. Recovery works great. Recovery increases that non exercise activity for uh, thermogenesis. That's huge for burning calories. Um, and you can't spot reduce. So we already know this now. So I've told you that if you hammer a muscle for 12, 15 reps, it's going to get bigger. It's going to swell up. So if you want to get your thighs smaller and you're hammering an adductor, adductor machine, you're actually hypertrophy, cytoplasmic hypertrophy on your adductors. It's going to make them bigger. Um, your body will burn energy how it burns energy. You're better off doing full body strength workouts, not, not going to town with one particular area. Go back to that 360 approach to nutrition and lifestyle. Um, and just play the long game, because it does take a bit of time to try and enjoy the process as you do it. And uh, so, my kind of key point is um, if you've sort of bored with the people now, um, remember, central nervous system drives everything. You get stronger because your brain gets better at recruiting muscle. Too much training at high intensity, making yourself really sore, won't lead to performance gains, won't lead to increased muscle gains, it won't lead to an awful lot of oh, injury. Your proportions affect everything. Try and find a lift that feels comfortable for your body rather than the other way around. Um, yeah, back to my 306 degree approach. To anything you do, be it strength training, weight loss, uh, bodybuilding, and always trying to think of other lifestyle factors. Matt? Thank you very much. Any other questions? Did I cover a lot of friendly, so you know who you are? I've got a question. Yeah. Got a question. Yeah, so one of your... What's well, sorry? Last time, sorry? I did, yeah. I did. I love questions. Um, so, one of your slides said, like, if you're an office worker, do this. If you run, sometimes do that. And if you cycle to work, do these exercises. What if... You are an office worker who cycles to work every day and goes running sometimes. What, what's the perfect yeah, yeah. workout? <laughs> I generally always I make it with hinge more anyway, so I fall into the the cycling category. And hinge more, hinging is way more for money. Um, what is hinging? I would take the stress off the knees generally. Um, try okay. and make things more hip dominant. So you can still do knee dominant exercise and then step ups rather than um, if you change the range of motion, you just do a, a, a low point step up. Um, and listen to your body and recover. Um, if you've got knee pain, back pain, then you need to start doing things. But yeah, that's when it comes to program design. That's the, the art, I guess, then, of designing a program. Um, but don't just think hammering everything all the time. Don't think you have to, so if your cycling's work, and you're doing a lot of running, I, I wouldn't have too many strength workouts in that, where you have to. Um, and I try and drop recovery in properly to make sure that you are ready to do the strength. Okay, yeah, and would you drop the squat instead of I and you would do uh, drop the squat and I would do more. the deadlift? Generally, I would always For example. My, I'm, I'm push more towards the hinge pattern anyway. Okay. But then you have, and then it hasn't got me the only hinge. You can do back extensions, kettlebell swings, you yeah. can do glute hand raise, you can do bar hip thrusters, hip bridges. They're all hinge patterns. Like people start thinking the glute exercise is getting back to that. It's a hip hinge. If I'm lying on my shoulders on the bench, bar my hips, and I'm doing a hip thruster, the hip goes through the most rotational force. It moves the furthest away from that vertical line. Therefore, it's, it's a hinge pattern. So you might well just put them on and those hinges. Some people are like, I can't get it, it hurts my lower back. There's going to be a version of a hip hinge that you can find that fits. Um, the conventional deviate is a powerlifting exercise. That's it. It's not the best one, it's just one. So you can sumo deadlift, so you can take the stance wider. Um, I can track bar deadlift, the hex bar deadlift, to so stand taller and make it a bit more knee dominant if I wanted to. Um, I can lower deadlift from the top down, take it from a pin, step back and then hinge and then have a go all the way to the floor. There are tons of ways that you can deadlift um, and squat. 
Um, so, and if you go down to one leg, if I do a single leg RDL, so a single leg hip hinge, you can't lift much weight, so you're not going to put a lot of stress on your lower back. So find the one that fits. Any more questions? Yeah. Oh, brilliant. So I love intermittent fasting. It, it depends on the person. Um, I'm a big fan of training fasting. Um, some people hate it. Like a lot of women I put on it hate it. Women just generally. Well, no, I generally find that from my experience, I've actually found my male clients can handle it recently better. Um, women it seems to be effective in more, but that's just, that's the population that I train. Um, the problem with intermittent fasting is like female weight training. There's not a lot of, awful lot of research on it because who's the fun of research on not eating? There's no money for making it. Um, <laughs> the kind of idea you have to easily fuel the body after training is a little bit misleading. You can the body's not this delicate flower that has to be fed straight away. There's no such thing as like a, a post-workout window. So as long as you're eating food within sort of 12 hours, so you can you can buy on me. I wouldn't necessarily start fast after training. But I'm more happy to, to, yeah, to, to fast, just play around and fast forever in that window of work. But um, it's more about finding out, you need to make sure you can train hard. So it's finding out when in the, in the day after a fast you can train. Um, but I'm a massive fan of the fasting, uh, it's not necessarily just to create an energy deficit, just in the general sort of health market. Um, anything else? Let me answer very well. Anything else? Yeah? Oh, there's time for more. No? Done. It's amazing. Thanks.